Welcome to the Left of Straight Show, where we talk entertainment, music, books, foodies, and more each week with special guest interviews of interest to the LGBTQ community and our straight allies. Direct from the entertainment capital of Northeast Ohio. Northeast Ohio. Your host, Scott Fullerton, chats with some of your favorite entertainers, celebrities, newsmakers, and behind-the-scenes people across the country and around the world who make it all happen. So sit back, grab your favorite beverage, and let's start talking. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Left of Straight Show, the podcast that's always a little bit left of center. I'm your host, as always, Scott Fullerton, and I'm joined today by one of my amazing interns here at Left of Straight Radio, Leah. Leah, how are you today? Hello, I'm doing good. I am so glad to have you on. One of your first projects here at Left of Straight Radio was to research who'd be a good guest for the Left of Straight Show and you chose our guests today, and what an incredibly special guest they are. They breathe life into characters across the spectrum of gender in video games, theme parks, and localization projects. As a professional voice actor and writer, from video games to animated TV series, they are all over the entertainment world. You might know them from projects like Hades the Game, Sword Art Online, or Little Witch Academia. They're also a tireless advocate for inclusivity in the voiceover industry and a non-binary trailblazer. Let's waste no time here and please welcome for the very first time to the Left of Straight Show, Marin Miller. Marin, how are you today? Oh, hello. I'm staying awake, so doing pretty good so far. How are you guys? I am good. I'm so excited to meet you. Uh, Leah here was our uh, was our big impetus to meet. Leah, how excited? Leah, how excited are you? I'm very excited. It's super cool to be able to <laughs> sit in on this. So yeah, Marin, one of my first things I have my interns do when they come on is kind of uh, learn how to get a guest. They're all they're all going to hopefully do their own podcast someday and learn a little bit about it. So I asked them to kind of choose a guest that might be good for the Left of Straight show. And Leah, what, uh, what made Marin such a perfect person for this? I heard about you because I'm super into Destiny. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I know there's like a lot of mixed opinions about Lightfall, but I loved it. It was amazing. I loved Nimbus. So when I was looking for a guest, I was like, wait a second. <laughs> I think I know. <laughs> I think I know the perfect person I could ask. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for asking me. We are excited to have you. Uh, first time guests, I always like to ask the same first two questions. First, tell me about where you grew up and what kind of a kid were you? Oh, God. <laughs> well, I grew up in the middle of nowhere. Um, I, it was in the desert outside of uh, Los Angeles. And um, when I was uh, just going into high school, I think, um, my parents and I moved even further out into the middle of nowhere where there were like no paved roads or anything um, because we had too many horses. So um, I kind of grew up as the indoor kid in an outdoor family. <laughs> um, so I was very nerdy and uh, kind of awkward and weird. And I would like write my friends personal newsletters about my life, I guess. I don't know. It was really awkward but um you know i also spent a lot of time laying on the floor pretending i was conducting video game soundtracks and uh mes memorizing um movie scripts uh but um yeah so i i really was kind of the the outgoing like outgoing sort of performer type ever since i was very young um and i but i really loved playing like video games and i really loved um watching anime in particular because uh mm -hmm. 
when I when I was young, it very much frustrated me that like a lot of American cartoons, like something big would happen and then uh, they'd forget about it in the next episode. And like when I started mm-hmm. watching anime as a young teenager, um, I was like, oh, these characters like learn and they grow and they reference things that happened before. And I think this is so cool that like you can see a person change. Um, and I really wanted to be a part of that. So I started um <laughs> being awkward as a teenager at other voice actors and going to conventions and so yeah I, that's kind of just how I've been always is just um I, I've only just started like COVID unlocked the introvert mode <laughs> but growing up I was very much the extrovert um uh in a in the middle of nowhere and riding horses in the desert and uh, bothering people with letters <laughs> Wow, that is amazing. Yeah, I think COVID changed all of us in one way or another. We all kind of found out a little bit more of our true selves, that's for sure. Or, or we yeah. changed our true selves to what uh, what we needed to do to adapt to make ourselves feel safe, I guess. Yeah. Um, and then my second question I'd like to ask everyone is, when did you first come out to yourself as non-binary? Who was the first person you told? And when or where did you first kind of find your tribe or have you yet? I definitely feel as though I've found, I've started finding my tribe for sure. Um, When it comes to my non-binary journey, the trans journey, like, um, I guess that's something that like, I I only really started becoming aware of it in my late 20s. And that was because other people started kind of being like, oh, you, you're gender nonconforming. And I was like, am I? (laughs) <laughs> I got the shaved head, sure, but whatever. And then I I think um, I've always been the kind of person I was raised by two generations of prison guards. So um, I've always been the kind of person who muscled through things and kind of ignored my own problems. And, you know, oh, if I'm struggling with something, suck it up. But, um, you know, when friends would tell me about gender fluidity, that was the only thing I really knew of for a long time was um, gender fluidity and gender queerness. I wasn't really aware of non non binary was when it the the idea started clicking with me when I started hearing that word. And that was around 2018, 2019. Um, But before that, I would have like friends would come up and be like, I'm gender fluid. And I'd be like, "Okay, cool. What? pronoun should I use and they're like this and I'm like all right cool I could do that I mean I don't really understand doesn't everyone feel this way and you know of course now I'm like no Marin, not everybody feels this way <laughs> you big dummy um but uh yeah like so when I in 2018 I was cast as a character called I apologize in advance if you hear peeps my cat just loves to be part of conversations um but uh, in 2018, I was cast as a character called Izanami in a show called Be the Beginning. And uh, that was explicitly, that character was explicitly described as being between the genders of male and female. Um, I don't believe we used they, them for pronouns to refer to that character. But um, that was at the time I was like, oh, okay, well, that makes sense because I play a lot of little boys at the time and a lot of my career leading up to that point was young boys. Uh, So my Japanese clients had kind of zeroed in on me sounding a little more masculine. Um, And uh, then um, I started doing a little more research because I had also been recommended for, um, I had gotten called back for Sailor Uranus in Sailor Moon. and she is a very prominent lesbian character in that show. Um, and ooh, sorry, meat, Meatball, come on, buddy. <laughs> um, <laughs> she is a, a lesbian character. Um, and then um, I also was recommended and got called back for one of the Sailor Stars, who um, that was a season that was never dubbed over here in the U.S. And um, I think it was because... Uh, so the the way I think they try to exp- and I'm not I don't work with Deke I was way too young but at, at the time when uh, Sailor Moon was being localized I think uh, the clients were trying to find a way to make it appeal to American audiences and this is not just the U S side this is also the Japanese side um, and so in order to explain the lesbians in Sailor Moon season one they made them cousins to explain an extra layer of intimacy and affection between them I guess 
you i don't understand but okay um and then uh, sailor stars came out and that one featured characters who were boys during the day or during their normal lives and then they would transform into women um in, in their sailor scout form so trans feminine characters uh basically and um of course all of them were cast by cis women but uh <laughs> that's neither here nor there when i was recommended people kept saying yeah i'm really trying to push for like queer and like gender non-conforming people to represent these characters and that's when i started putting it together and then izanami happened around the same time and i was like oh this keeps happening this mu there must be something about this so i started looking into it more and uh, that's when i started learning about non-binary identities and realizing that there were things about me and my sexuality that had been signaling these uh this transness for the whole the whole of my life <laughs> you know you know I, the, when you have distinct memories of sitting in math class in seventh grade and mrs vondra is talking about algebra and i'm like man it would be cool to be named alex because you don't know if that gender is like male or female and like when i even years later uh, when i worked at universal studios i was a clown and p even though i wore a big pink dress i would walk around and speak in this really um screechy feminine voice they'd st still call me a man or people would not know what gender i was and i got a huge kick out of that um so uh finally i was cast as enki do who um is a character in the fate grand order universe um and the fate series basically is uh these servants are um people summon servants like pokemon to fight servants are uh different historical figures throughout time and so enkidu and gilgamesh are two servants and so they were telling the story of gilgamesh um grieving the loss of enkidu and then uh anyway i come in and i'm enkidu and this was the first character that i ever voiced that was explicitly they them and um they explained that to me as i came in and i was struggling at the time i was like i think like I had had a conversation with a friend earlier that year who was um, fundraising for their top surgery and they told me about um, their experience on testosterone. And that's when I was like, I'm trans, <laughs> this is me. And that was probably around March of that year. And then I got cast in, um, I wanna say June or July. And I was still really on the fence um, about coming out because I didn't know if I was really trans i didn't know if this was something that i was just kind of latching onto because it felt trendy or comfortable and i just wanted an excuse to feel better about myself and i mean that's the fucking point uh, to feel better about yourself <laughs> um, but uh you know there's a lot of denial but when i got cast as enki do and it was explicit that they were a they them because uh, they're made of clay uh they don't have genitals um and they take on while they are often presented in a masculine fashion they also like took on the form of a female prostitute after learning about humanity so um there's a lot of gender new neutrality within that character even in the mythology um i knew that if i were to accept this role and not at least be open about the fact that I was gen like questioning my gender, it would just feel wrong for me personally to t continue taking these roles that were explicitly non-binary or that referred to these characters as trans without myself, you know, being like, yes, this is, this is me. This is, I, I'm okay, you know, being here and these people do exist. Cause you know, like when I started, um, when I, especially as Nimbus, I started having people email me and be like, I had no idea non-binary actors even existed. Um, so that was a, a big reason why I decided to come out was because um, I really didn't think that if I was going to be externalizing the, if I was going to be, you know, taking explicitly non-binary roles, <laughs> I wanted to make sure that people knew that there were explicitly non-binary people existing <laughs> to fill those roles and that, you know, there's more work where this came from hopefully <laughs> um so yeah and that was so that was coming out um but the first person i came out to was uh i think my husband and he was very supportive um i you know i think we kind of had the the question of well what is the the end goal here and i was like i don't i don't know and i still don't know um but you know even at the time it was at the time it was just 
they just call me they and then you know maybe uh i think a year later i can't i picked the name marin and then um a few months after that testosterone and all that stuff um and then i forget what the final part of the question was but yeah that was pretty much it where you found your tribe that's how i think you answered more towards the beginning but that's exactly what we're looking for and i appreciate Hmm. you sharing that because it's, I get a lot, I get confused sometimes with pronouns. I have a lot of my straight and gay friends that don't understand it, but it's like, we're still understanding ourselves, right? It took you a while to kind of figure out what steps you were into becoming you, right? So I, I yeah. like that you shared that. I also think it's important for us to share like how there, we have like such gradual steps in our journey as well. Cause you know, like um, even now there are still days where I'm like, am I doing this right? You know, and even when I was trying to decide um, what I ultimately, what ultimately made it easier for me to pull the trigger was I can change my mind and undo this at any time. And even now, you know, whatever changes have happened can still be undone. And it wouldn't, I don't think that I would have done anything regretful to this point, even if I did decide that this was not my identity. I, I think I've I've been very happy with the changes that have been made. And if I did decide, okay, yeah, back to assigned gender at birth, I, it still would not take away the knowledge that I gained from this transition. So I I think it's important to acknowledge how much, how fluid the, the gender journey is for anyone who feels uncertain, you know? Very well said. Leah, I'm going to give you the first question since you were you brought Marin here. What what question do you have first? Well, you said you've gotten um, a few chances to play non-binary characters. How would you say, like, I guess, what's your estimation of how many non-binary characters you get to play versus playing a masculine or feminine character? I'd say. Um... I don't know. The The number of non-binary characters obviously is changing a lot because uh, media is still catching up with society. Um, and uh, it isn't until we start seeing these characters represented in media that we really start recognizing them in the real world. Um, so uh, I when I when I started, I definitely, I have always leaned more towards masculine characters. And I think that's because I have a naturally more masculine cadence. Um, And, you know, we can get into the gender of speaking and physiology and all that later. But, (laughs) um, but, uh, and uh, since I was um, primarily marketing myself towards a uh, Japanese clientele, uh, because I was working with, um, anime dub clients, uh, their binary is very harsh. Um, but that being said, if there are, they are more open to women outside of that binary voicing more feminine men. Um, so that was something that I was always really drawn to, um, and something that I wanted to work towards. Uh, so I'd say like, especially in the early years, I was very drawn towards male, young male characters. Um, generally prepubescent boys was what I would book. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then um, it wasn't until I started, I think after I got married that I started booking more femme roles. But even then, like, um, for whatever reason, and I don't know why, but people would say that my voice before, excuse me, hiccups, my people, people would say my voice before, uh, all of this was um deeper for a woman even though like i would sing i could sing high b above the staff i sounded very feminine to me but it just wouldn't make any sense people would still say you sound so masculine compared to or so deep compared to other women so but to me i'm just like this sounds i sound so cutesy and young i don't like this um uh, but anyway, so I, I feel like it's not been until I my voice started deepening from the testosterone and until I started getting older and more mature that I started booking feminine roles. And I think that's because um, I tended to go more mature on the read and I, I sounded like I had an old soul, perhaps, or mm-hmm. maybe I just don't sound as pretty because um, <laughs> uh I, I find that um, if you have a lower voice, uh, you tend to book a lot less because they'll bring in, if I audition for the cutesy young girls, 
Um, I do not sound as young or as cutesy as somebody who uh, has a much younger sounding and brighter sounding voice. Uh, so they tend to get brought in for those main characters and then they get tend to get trusted with the smaller roles as well because it's novel for them to go from up here oh my gosh i'm so young and cute to down here oh i'm so svelte and everyone's like oh my gosh that's amazing but you know if i give you four different voices within the same vocal range it's not as impressive to a client because it's not as big of a pitch drop a lot of the times so um anyway uh i think it took me a while to grow up uh, into my voice for people to take me seriously as a woman <laughs> because I tended to sound very commanding even as a young woman um, uh, and uh, that's only tended to kind of become more true as my voice has deepened um, and I think that's just because now I tend to fit a very niche kind of woman <laughs> you know the Ursula type um, and the non-binary characters, um, I have started seeing a lot more auditions for those. Nimbus is probably the largest non-binary character I've booked. Um, and that's just because, and I mean in terms of like their character arc and stuff. Although Enkidu is pretty meaty as well. Um, and that was a 24 episode series and they were kind of like the lead anti-hero sort of deal. Um, but yeah, so I have a feeling that the, my career will continue to fluctuate. And honestly, um, I would love to see more non-binary characters because I find that the arcs that they have are a little more meaty and emotionally fulfilling to me personally as a performer, because feminine identity tends to be dictated by specific societal influences, like having a baby, being a mother, getting married, that sort of stuff, um, that doesn't is not as valuable to me. Like I'm not interested by that and I don't connect to that. Uh, that's some, like my, my breeding parts are not usable. <laughs> I don't want to use them and I have no interest in exploring that part of myself. <laughs> so um, that's why I, I liked being part of a non-binary character because it just didn't feel as heavily policed as, because um, I just hate being a, trying to be a woman and then somebody's like that doesn't sound right i'm like fuck you <laughs> it doesn't sound sexy to you <laughs> very true now you've been able to play both these uh, male and female parts is that versatility kind of standard in your industry or are you kind of uh, able to stand out from the rest because of able to do both of these genders I think there are plenty of actors who have the versatility necessary to play uh, multiple genders. Um, but I think that the biggest issue is that we are not seen as marketable, quote unquote. Um, like, I bring this up all the time, but Lizzo did a show called uh, Bring On the Big Girls, I think it was. Um, but she she basically did an audition uh, for dancers for her tour and all of the agents that she partnered with to try and bring dancers meatball come on get out of here <laughs> he's orange i'm gonna close this door Aww. one brain cell and he barely uses it okay so um <laughs> lizzo asked a bunch of agents to help her Lizzo asked a bunch of agents to help her staff her tour for dancers. Um, and the agents were not able to deliver any dancers that she needed because the agents did not represent plus size dancers. So it's not as though plus size dancers don't exist. It's that the agents who saw plus size dancers saw those dancers, looked them in the face and said, you are not marketable. But who is the agent to say that? The agent does not hire the dancers. The agent simply determines, yes, this person is talented enough for me to market to somebody. But if you're going to be dismissed simply because of the size of your body and not actually because of your ability, then doesn't matter how good or bad you are if the person in the room is not willing to believe that you can deliver. So um, likewise, I think it's the same sort of thing with um, 
trans talent or, you know, masculine talent, feminine talent, non-binary talent. I think a lot of these agents get in their heads about what is marketable, what sounds marketable. And for women, it tends to sound like this. And for men, it tends to sound like this. And it's just, it's a joke. <laughs> it's a fucking joke. Um, and, you know, I, I'm lucky now in that, like, more non-binary uh, voice, like, non-binary voices are starting to get heard more. And I tend to have a an androgynous sort of sound. So I'm very fortunate in that. And granted, I was not born with this voice. I have taken hormones to alter my voice to get to this point. And that was a decision I made because I personally wanted a deep voice. That was something I really wanted. Um but I don't think, you know, um, uh, every cis woman should have to take hormones if they want to be marketable as a mid-low voice, you know. Um, so I would say it's it's more common than you might think. Um, but unfortunately, like it, <laughs> it tends to get lost in the in the binary of it all. Um, anime tends to be a little more uh, like f okay with messing around with the the gender lines because, um, as I said before, like um, like in Japan, it, it's more like uh, if if you're a big beefy guy, that's that's more like for gay men. <laughs> and if you want uh, to appeal to a femme audience, you have like these very beautiful, slim, slender, pretty boys, you know, so like their standard of beauty is totally different over there, which means that the their ideal voice is totally different. So maybe their ideal voice might be something around like here for a man. Oh, don't you want to have this sexy young man whisper in your voice or in your ear or whatever, you know, but uh, and then over here. Uh, it's very different. So I think it, it comes down to like what industry you're in and if you're dubbing, what country are you dubbing from and stuff. But um, anyway, I especially for trans actors, I think it's very common to find people who will do everything. <laughs> Long story short. <laughs> no, that's amazing. And it's so well said about the agents and people representing you. I mean, I think that's so important for people to understand that. That uh, yeah. that's just such a good point. Leah, what do you have? Oh, I was interested in um, how voice acting for like video games compares to voice acting for television. Like, does does the medium afford you? Does either medium afford you opportunities that like the other one might not offer? So, um, let me think. I haven't done a whole lot of prelay. I was in Lego Friends for three years, but that show has gone through like four casts now. <laughs> um, but that's about the only prelay I've done. And then video games, I've done a, a fair amount. And then um, anime is, is and dubbing is my big field of expertise. So anime and uh, dubbing and video games are not too dissimilar. Um at least in my experience, uh, because video games and anime are both done, uh, recorded individually. So um, even though I was, you know, reacting and responding to um, Oded and uh, Dave Fenoy, I didn't really hear them. Um, it wasn't until I literally only heard two lines the entire time I was recording. Um, and one of the lines was Rohan saying, in the right context, and that was because I had to mimic him. And they still had me record like a placeholder line, um, but I had to come back a few months later and then they were like, all right, let's pick this one up. And then I went, they played Dave Fenoy and I was like, oh, that's Dave Fenoy. And then, <laughs> cause I didn't know who was playing Rohan. And, uh, and then I mimicked him. And then um, the other line that I got to hear was um, at the very end of the campaign when Osiris is talking about Sagira and uh, Nimbus is asking about um, Sagira uh, and Osiris says something she and then he pauses she told me don't lose hope to the darkness or something like that but I remember that line because he swallows in the little pause that he takes and I was like oh, I can hear his throat this is so weird <laughs> but um 
but yeah and then like same with dubbing uh it's very much like we basically get to watch our line so if our character's on screen but we aren't speaking we have no idea what's going on in those scenes we literally only see the bits that our character is speaking so um like we'll hear like the tail end of a, a line or something like that and then we'll be like oh is that so and so and if we're lucky we're they'll tell us yes or no but like i when i was um i just recorded a fate strange fake whispers of dawn which is an ova and was premiered at anime expo but there is a japanese voice actor in there that like i grew up really loving his name is tomokazu seki and um actually uh I snuck into his panel at Anime Expo almost 20 years ago to see him. And then um, when I was recording, I got to hear like his laughing um, in the previews. And I was like, oh, I'm living a dream. <laughs> but um, uh, with Prelay, it's very different because um, you can take things like a scene. You can run a scene at a time or you can do it individually. You can do the lines individually or you can do them uh, recorded chorus style. Um, for prelay and uh, for prelay, it's it's more budget friendly to record them chorus style because you can just have all the actors go one at a time. But with video games and with dubbing, it's a lot more. Um, there's a lot more technical technical stuff involved. Like uh, with Destiny, um, I had I I I I don't know if I was the first one cast, but um, Nimbus was the lead. So they were very heavily focused on making sure that Nimbus was taken care of, I think, before other characters were. Um, at least that was my impression. I don't have that info. But uh, uh, like when I was recording, I had like a giant headpiece on. And if I moved my head too suddenly and it, it came out probably, I want to say, two feet at least a foot and a half oh, um, it, with a camera point, multiple cameras pointed at my face so they could get the facial capture if they needed it. Um, and so like recording that with multiple people swinging around cameras, that could get kind of, <laughs> that could get kind of messy real fast. Sounds dangerous. <laughs> yeah. And with dubs, like you have to match things so specifically um, that if you have one actor that even flubs just one line, you would have to redo a whole scene or whatever. It just isn't cost efficient uh, because when we're in the booth, you're also paying everybody that's there by the hour. Uh, nobody gets paid salary. So um, if you figure the more time it takes to figure something like that out, the more you have to pay. <laughs> so it's always just been cheaper and more efficient for us to just be brought in one at a time. Uh, and that's why having a good director is so important, because if the director doesn't have the idea of what the chemistry of the scene is supposed to sound like in their head, then good luck. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Now you talk about doing this for Japan and other places. You know a jillion languages, it seems. What was the di most <laughs> difficult language for you to learn? Well, um, well, let me see. I've I've studied German, Japanese, Italian, Spanish, and Mandarin. I'd say probably the most difficult. I don't know. I mean, because. Like you would think Jap I, I feel like Mandarin is pretty difficult, but it's it's pretty straightforward. The most difficult part of Mandarin is the tones, I feel like. Um, because mm -hmm. like they have very specific inflections um that you have to mimic. So and I'm I'm very much like if I don't pronounce this like a native, I'm not saying it. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel the most intimidated to speak mandarin for sure um because and i i also know i think i i probably worked on that one the least um but yeah uh and german is the one that i know the best um but yeah <laughs> mandarin mandarin is a lot easier if you already know japanese though because like although even that being said it's it's almost a little more confusing because like their numbers are the same pretty much but the the way you say the number like if you see a german one it looks the same as an english one because the alphabet is more or less the same and chinese is the origination of japanese so you know the numbers are the same but then it's like oh fuck i gotta remember a whole new set of words <laughs> <laughs> my dad learned mandarin when he was in the service and stationed overseas there and he said something about the tones as well i don't remember what it was but when we would always try to see if he could remember anything he said I can do it, but my tone is all off. And so I didn't really understand that. Yeah. Before, so. That's yeah. kind of cool. 
I love the Asian languages because um, they're phonetic, so it's really interesting as opposed to, uh, you know, English, where it's just sort of like, I mean, obviously we have diphthongs and shit like that, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. I love it. <laughs> I only ever took French in the, high school. That, that one, you don't say any consonants. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so I guess my next question is, do you ever find that your experience as a writer and your experience as an actor synergize? Like, does one ever inspire the other? Absolutely. Um, I, it's funny because, like, I kind of, cons I started writing as, like, a way to step back from acting because I was just in such a bad place when it came to acting. Um, like I was, uh, I was working on, uh, sorry, let me back up. <laughs> when I started writing, it felt kind of like a retreat from acting because I was just not really finding a whole lot of success at the time. Like I was auditioning a ton, like as an actor, you have to audition one or 200 times a year. Uh, and you're lucky if you book like one of those auditions. Um, a lot of the, uh, the bookings that I get are like recurring, not recurring, but returning work from the same clients who are like, ah, oh, we heard you do something that we liked before. Um, and so those smaller roles have just kind of gotten bigger and bigger as the years have gone by. Um, cause I've been doing this for about 17 years. Um, but, uh, when I started writing, I was just like in a really bad spot i felt like i was throwing things at the wall i felt like i wasn't getting anywhere and i felt like i was going nuts because especially with commercial auditions you're some of them are just like pineapples blah, 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 blah. and like it's you like you just say a word and that's it you know and they they have like 20 words to describe how they want you to say this one word and i'm like i don't know if this sounds ethereal and effervescent and mysterious i don't fucking know <laughs> Um, so, uh, so yeah, I just, I took a break and I ended up getting contacted to do some production work because, um, somebody, uh, Stephanie Shea, who's a friend of mine knew that I was kind of wanting to start doing that. Um, and I found that it was like, it was the nice thing about writing is that you don't have like the long, cause like with acting, you're lucky if you book a few times a month, but with writing, it's like, okay, I know I'm going to have a job for four to six weeks, usually if I'm lucky. Um, and, uh, so, you know, since it takes more time, I have a little bit more financial stability. Um, but also, uh, I get, I, I get to say the things, you know, I may not be the one saying the things, but I get to put the words in the mouth. So like, sure, I don't get to say the really funny stuff, but like, I, <laughs> I got to write this stupid line. Um, and I don't know what the rating is on this show. I apologize, but I worked on this, this uh, reality show last year called Rio Shore. And um, it's the Brazilian spinoff of Jersey Shore. And um, these characters are ridiculous. I, I never thought I would Let get tired. Let I, it fly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never thought I would get tired of watching straight people have sex, but somehow I did. And I was getting paid for it. It was on this show and I had to dub it. So, um, but one of the lines I got to write, and this is like why I love being a writer, is uh, he was one. It was one of the characters' birthday, and this guy was trying to get in her pants. So he was like, "Happy birthday to Nat! My, I'm the present. I just got to put a little bow on my dick." <laughs> like that was the line. <laughs> so like, uh, I feel like my what even though my voice isn't there my voice is there you know i'm i'm writing there are some lines that you're in the show or when you're watching a show that i've written that i'm just like me uh and um also you know as a dub writer um i have to physically say the words out loud as i'm writing because otherwise how am i gonna know if it fits and i have to say it a few different types of ways and um it kind of, as I started doing that more, you start realizing like, oh, there are a lot of different ways that you can say things. Cause like the context of look over there could be happy, could be sad, could be frantic. It could be, you're telling somebody right here, you're telling somebody all the way over there to look over there, you know? So when, when I started 
when that started happening and I started seeing all these different scenarios, because my problem is like, it's hard for me to conceptualize certain things unless I can see an example of it. So, you know, just having more examples of different kinds of contexts for emotions and how that sounds is very helpful, but also physically needing to speak a lot uh, and needing to make sure that things match a lot just on the fly. <sighs> it's uh, definitely helpful when it comes to dubbing, at least. Uh, and I was, I was definitely so brain dead <laughs> by, <laughs> because I was working on this fucking reality show. I was so brain dead by the time I got to destiny, I wasn't even in my head about any of the reads because <laughs> I was just so used to hearing every possible way of saying something. I love that. Well, you say you've been doing this for 17 years now. Talk about, I mean, the voiceover industry is, has become more inclusive. I mean, you got platforms like Blue Way VoiceOver now offering selections of transgender and non-binary talents. How has the industry evolved in your head since you first started and where do you see it heading in terms of representation, representation and inclusivity? I think honestly, I mean, I think about this a lot. Uh, when I was growing up and even when you were growing up and, and as each generation has kind of come along, like, I don't think people realize how little talent has had anything to do with a lot of these decisions when it came to who was appearing on camera. There are a lot of things that have nothing to do with talent, like how you look, how you were born looking. Like if I lose weight, I can't stop being six feet tall and that I'm going to be taller than Tom Cruise. So I can never star in a movie across from Tom Cruise unless he's the 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 female in this situation that's how hollywood has set up this binary you know for people like me to lose um so uh that being said it was all about finding people they could either manipulate or people that were marketable enough that they could synergize with to try and get butts in the seats that's all it was really about um nowadays we understand that you know these there should be authenticity in these things that people are using to inform how they treat the people around them. Um, and a lot of people only have, because we're all working ourselves to death, movies and TV is the only way we really get to understand the inner workings of the people around us because we don't have the energy to really dig into, you know, these conversations about identity and stuff in real life. Um, so crap i've lost my train of thought um what was the question again <laughs> well it's more just for, from your 17 oh, how years how change and everything right right yes that sorry i have adhd that happens sometimes um <laughs> so <laughs> that being said um i feel like we have definitely gotten to a point now where more people are being considered than ever and um acting is more accessible than it, it has ever been. But that being said, it's also more competitive than ever because we have, we previously had issues of, you know, agencies keeping people out. Um, what I was talking about before, keeping out fat people, that was true of black people, brown people, trans people, Asian people, any sort of people that is not white, straight, cis, male, or beautiful, skinny female. All of those people were kept out, but now we're kind of all being considered a little more equally, maybe not equally, but you know, <laughs> some of us are give, being given more than the 0.2 seconds we were given before. Um, and uh, I think what people don't realize is that we're not going to necessarily be seeing the same sort of like superstars that we grew up with, you know, where it's the same sort of handful of people doing the same thing or doing a bunch of different things because we want to show off the range of this one singular person because they are marketable. It's more about trying to make people understand authentic experiences. So that means that we're going to have like more work spread out amongst more people as opposed to more work for fewer people. So I, I only mention this because like, I think like, you know, for people who are struggling in the industry, because there are hundreds and thousands of people who want to voice and stuff at any given moment, um, we are beating ourselves up because we don't have the, the long storied resumes of the people that came before us. And the truth of the matter is that those people were incredibly lucky, even when that was a thing in those days. But also like, um, we're just not going to have like 
the same kind of thing. So nobody is a failure or anything like that if they're not able to keep up with this idea of who or what they should be as a performer in their minds. Because also, you know, by the time we heard about a lot of these actors, they were in their 30s or 40s. And chances are, if you're sitting and listening to this, uh, you're and angsting about your career, you're in your 20s, hopefully. <laughs> if you're in your 40s, then I don't know, maybe it's time for a change. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I think I, I definitely think that the we're seeing a lot more of a, the the competition is fierce and like I think that's good. Um, uh, it's it's nerve wracking for me because obviously you know um, seniority is never a guarantee of anything, uh, and I often f I feel I have felt for a long time that I've been passed up for a lot of other things just because my voice might not have been as marketable or maybe I was not as aligned as my cis, uh, you know, aligned psychologically or emotionally as my cis counterparts were. Um, but I, I don't know. I feel hopeful at least. I, I've done a lot of work to make sure that the industry improves and it has improved. Um, you know, like we've, we've done a lot of work to unionize, uh, dubbing in, in Los Angeles, especially. So, um, I, I feel warmed at least uh i don't feel discouraged for people it's it's hard um and a lot of my progress was made when i was cis but i feel like i've made bigger strides now having come out um so i don't think that i i don't think that it is what it used to be <laughs> if that makes sense it's amazing i mean that's all we can hope for right oh we have to start wrapping this up leah do you have any uh last questions that are burning on your mind here for them? Um, I guess my last question is, um, do you have any advice for up and coming transgender or non-binary voice actors who are looking to get into the industry? Or is there anything, any advice or encouragement you wish you'd been given when you were starting out? Uh, well, I would say make sure to recognize gender dysphoria when it's getting in the way. Because the Mia, the character I mentioned before, um, I actually almost didn't submit that audition and I didn't almost didn't book it because I didn't submit that audition. Because when I was listening to it, um, the character was kind of motherly and feminine. And I just kept listening to it and being like, this sounds like a fake girl. But what the what does that mean? <laughs> She's not fake. I'm a girl. <laughs> I was a girl at the time. <laughs> so uh, it just was like. It didn't feel authentic to me and it wasn't that I it wasn't that it wasn't auth good it was that I hadn't heard anything like it before or that it wasn't auth uh it didn't feel right to me and that's just my own internal narrative you know that has nothing to do with the person who's listening to what I'm doing so um you know if if you're having thoughts like that that's gender dysphoria <laughs> first of all so um take a break <laughs> and come back to it. But also, um, you know, I, I think a lot of us beat ourselves up because we don't sound like our maybe an expectation of what we should sound like as a cis person, either that expectation is our own or, or placed on us by somebody else. But either way, the voice that you have is marketable. If Richard Horvitz can book work, you can book work. Richard Horvitz is the voice of Invader Zim and, and Daggett. Um, and, and, you know, he's but he sounds like that. That is just his voice. So, like, the only reason why he's working is because he had enough faith in himself to be like, hey, even if I do suck, at least I sound unique enough to try. Um, and that's really the long and short of it. As as trans people, we need to kind of it, it might not be true. But it is helpful for me anyway to see if my to think of myself as a niche actor who, you know, is there when somebody needs it. And I might not work as much as my colleagues, but when someone needs me, I'm fucking there and I'm going to kick ass. And who knows, maybe eventually things will change to where I'll be given more meaty vehicles to display my skills. But that's that's something that's like a relationship, like a trust building relationship and and building a career especially as an actor is something that takes a lot of time and when you are working with someone uh on an original character like that is an exercise in trust that's somebody's baby that they are giving to you um to work on so um 
I guess I'd just say don't take rejection personally because there's going to be a shit ton of it regardless of what identity you are. Um, fight like hell for the voice that you have. If you don't like your voice, you can change it. Uh, there's speech therapy. There's hormones. You, any path is valid. Uh, keeping your voice the same is perfectly valid. And also, um, gender is a lie. <laughs> it's all a performance. So um, we're all performing. <laughs> Pick the performance that's most comfortable for you and um, don't apologize for it. There's always, oh, no, you can always learn, but um, calling yourself bad is not a good place to start because there's nowhere to improve from just being bad. You know, anyway, I hope that helps. I love that. Very inspiring. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. All right, Marin. so you were talking about your character of Ankidu, and I believe you have some kind of a clip you can share with us that talks about your voice, um, the changes in your voice, right? Yes, yeah, I have clips uh, here that show just a little bit of work that I did pre-voice drop uh, in 2019, as well as uh, just recently in 2023, uh, clips from Fate Strange Fake. That's amazing. All right, let's go ahead and play that. And guys, we'll talk about it on the other side here. We're uh, talking to our special guest, Marin Miller. They are an amazing voiceover actress that you're going to see right here as we go. Gil, be careful. A king should not be making such a depressing face. <laughs> I am her puppet and I do as she bids. That is all I need. Out of all creation, I am the most powerful thing on this planet! There's no need for a defective demigod like you! He's someone I should kill. But I want to talk. No, there's no room for conversation. I will kill him. Kill him. I must kill him. I must kill him. I must kill him. For mother's sake. I must kill him. I do not have the right to do such a thing. I am a tool, so how I should be depends on my master's will. But coming to this place was a decision I made all on my own. Why did you do that? I'm your enemy! I'm not your Enkidu! I'm not your friend! I'm not Enkidu! I would like you to wait here for a little while. I must take my leave now. This place is not suitable to bring him to. If I did, then the forest would die. More than anything, I'd have no way of protecting you. Enuma! Marin, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Let our listeners know where they can find you or some of the things they might be able to spot you in that they might want to look up. And do you have any kind of social media they can follow you at? Yeah, well, uh, all my social media, as far as I've tried to keep it, is Marin M. Miller VO. Uh, so that's on Twitter and that's on Blue Sky, uh, possibly Insta. I think there might not be a middle M there. Um, as for things that I'm in, uh, Trails of Reverie just, or yeah, Trails into Reverie just came out. It's a JRPG series. I reprise my role of Grace Lynn, and that is very exciting because uh, that's actually the f one. I think one of the first female characters that I reprised after my voice dropped, and it was also one of the highest voices that I've booked. So um, I managed to keep that relatively the same. Um, and then also, Fate Strange Fake Whispers of Dawn is out on Crunchyroll. That's another reprisal. I'm Enki doing that, and that was another one that was uh, I did the voice originally pre voice drop, and now I've done it again post voice drop. And I think um, this one's really nice because it sounds really husky and deep, and I like it. So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> hope you enjoy. Yeah, I like it. Very good. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the Let's Astray Show. Leah, any uh, last words? I think everything was extremely well said. A lot of it definitely resonated with me personally, and I can only guess that it'll resonate with so many more people when they hear it. Good. I'm glad. Well, it was an absolute pleasure. Guys, if you're listening, uh, Marin will be back Tuesday for five questions with. We're going to try to stump her on some fun questions here in just a little bit. And uh, thanks so much for listening to Left to Straight Show, the interviews. Uh, Marin Miller, 
been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. We'll see you next time. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to The Left of Straight Show. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast distributor and please give us a five-star rating so more listeners can find us. You can follow us on social media and be sure to check out our website, www.leftofstraightradio.com for contests and other news and information. See you next week.